this on? Sorry, it is. About five years ago, I was a brand new pastor here. I'd been here for less than a month. And I preached a message that dealt with the excuses that people often make for not serving in the church. I would help, but I'm too busy. I would serve, but they don't need me. I would give, but I have other bills to pay. The list could go on and on. Well, the sermon title was Big Butts. My wife has tried to put that sermon out of her mind now for about five years. That was the Sunday that as she was coming down out of the choir, I guess she stepped on the hem of her skirt and suddenly her skirt dropped to her ankles. I knew that I was in trouble as I was trying really hard not to laugh, but my whole body was shaking as I stood in front of her that day. And it made it worse when I looked out and I saw Blanche Ray and the whole pew was shaking. <laughs> my wife simply pulled up her skirt and came down out of the choir. <clears throat> And then my sermon began with a video. The first line of the video was very simple. Everybody's got a big butt. <laughs> my wife was a very good sport about it. She even showed up to choir practice later that evening wearing her suspenders. So, well, we have laughed about that on many occasions. And I've done everything I can to avoid preaching on big butts since then. That being said, I'm starting a new series today that is entitled Big Butts of the Bible. The series is very different from the sermon that I shared uh, several years ago in a couple different ways. First of all, we are hoping that there are no wardrobe malfunctions with this one. Second, I, I want us to look at various situations where the circumstances were very clear, but God intervened. And using the phrase, but God, we're not talking about the excuses that we often give to God as to why we can't do what he is calling us to do. Rather, we are talking about the miraculous works of God that he does to change our lives. These were individuals who were going in one direction, but Jesus interrupts them on their path placing them on a new and completely different path. Maybe you've wondered if you're too far from God for him to use. Maybe you've made some really poor decisions and somehow that disqualifies you from service and you're saying, but God, as an excuse. But what if God wants to step in and change everything in you? What kind of miraculous work does God desire to do in your life? And what kind of but God event has already taken place for you? I had an individual this morning share with me their testimony. It's a beautiful story of God's redeeming work. It was specifically, it was Brother Jimmy talking about how God had transformed their life many years ago. God stepped in and he intervened. It was a but God moment that changed everything for their family. If you would, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 9. I had Landon read a few verses from this. In this passage, we see a man who was born blind. He had a physical issue that had come to define who he was. In fact, he is likely a beggar with no other means of providing for his daily needs. But he is not the only one afflicted by blindness in this story. It just shows up in different ways for others. Look at this but God moment, beginning in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 5 to begin with here. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work while I am in the world. 
I am the light of the world. Now, we'll get to the man who was born blind in a few moments, but I want to start with the first people to talk in this story because in their speech, in their question, they reveal a type of blindness. I'm talking about Jesus' disciples. What they say reveals some incorrect preconceived notions about God that Jesus will need to address. It's not hard to see that Jesus' disciples had a form of religious blindness. Religious blindness is what occurs when you have an idea about God and you are so sure that you are right that you can't see the truth sitting right in front of your face. And by the way, I'll be the first to admit that there have been times that I have struggled with this religious blindness. In fact, I may even struggle with it from time to time even now. I think that sometimes people who have struggled most with this are the ones who should be most knowledgeable, those who have spent more time in the Word and study. I'll tell you, many of the ministers that I know would fit into this category. It's not an insult. I just think it's something we struggle with sometimes. The disciples reveal their religious blindness when they ask the question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They make an assumption that if someone was born blind, then it must be because of someone's specific sin. Now, on the one hand, this is a ridiculously foolish idea. This man was born blind, yet they ask if his blindness came from his own sin. It's as if God has chosen to preemptively punish him with blindness because one day he would sin. Even as an infant, he was going to sin, so God's going to punish him. That is a crazy idea. But the other side of this is their question reveals a common thought among the religious people of their day. Don't judge the people of their day too harshly, though. We do the same thing sometimes. We see God as nothing more than an agent of karma, people getting what they deserve. For example, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, at least one TV preacher openly stated that this was God's punishment for the sin that takes place there so often. When an earthquake struck Haiti, another preacher proclaimed that this was God's wrath against the voodoo practices that still take place in that location. I've heard similar accusations of God's wrath and punishment for everything from tornadoes in the Midwest, flooding in the South, and wildfires in California, with popular ministers referring to such acts as the finger of God sent as a divine warning to America. I have not yet heard it regarding this current coronavirus, but I'm sure someone will say it. Now, let's be clear about this. Certainly, there are times in the scriptures where we see God controlling the weather and even using weather as a tool of judgment. We see hailstorms and droughts and even global floods. Likewise, we see plenty of times when God judges humanity for sin. Those things are not in question here. The problem is that we often read about what God does in the Bible for one situation, and then we assume that every time these things happen moving forward, then God must be doing the same thing. So God sent a scorching wind in the book of Jonah. So every time we have a tornado, then God must be judging humanity for their sin. I will tell you that that is a leap in our logic that the Bible does not require of us. In other words, it is possible that God's punishment is taking place in these situations, but it's also possible that it's simply a part of us living in a fallen world where bad things happen to all kinds of people. The problem is that religious blindness tries to force God into a system that makes sense to us. Now we understand, now we get it. Religious blindness thinks that it has mastered God. God, you must fit into my box. You must do things exactly the way I think you should do them. 
I said it earlier, but I know this is something that I have struggled with at times. I've worked out in my mind what makes sense for God to do. And maybe it's scriptural, maybe it just sounds logical to me. But then God chooses to do something different. And I wonder to myself, God, what are you thinking? I might not say that because that would sound ignorant. But that's what goes through my mind. But his ways are higher than my ways. He always knows what's best. You know, I think all of us have some preconceived notions about God and what he should do or what he will do. Some think every storm must be God's judgment, while others think that God will never judge anyone. Either way, we all have a tendency to see God in the way that best fits our own preferences. So if you're a victim and you long for justice, you might see God as a judging God. He is going to exact vengeance upon humanity. If you see yourself in need of grace, you might see God as a God of grace, always willing to forgive those who have offended him. So the disciples ask the question, who sinned? Somebody had to sin. Otherwise, this guy wouldn't have been born blind. They've worked God into their own system, and Jesus needs to correct their thinking. He replies, no, you've got this all wrong. This isn't about sin. It wasn't his sin or even his parents' sin. This happened so that God's power could be revealed. It's funny that the first thought of the disciples is that God is about punishing others, when in reality, this story was about God's desire to heal others. Look at verses 6 and 7 of our passage. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now, of course, this is a really cool story, and surely the highlight of this story is the healing of this man. But there are some really important little details that are in the background of this passage. For example, Jesus had the ability to heal this man simply by speaking the words, be healed. This guy could have turned and all of a sudden had his eyes open and he would have been able to see. Remember the scales that were on Paul's eyes or Saul's eyes? When Ananias prayed over him, the scales fell off and suddenly he could see. Could Jesus not have done the same thing? He could have, but he didn't. So the question is, why not? Perhaps the rest of the story is supposed to mean something to us. First of all, Jesus begins by getting dirty. He's one of the most well-respected men around, yet he gets dirty, playing in the mud and then touching an unclean man. It speaks to his compassion and humility. But then he instructs this man to go and to wash in the pool of Siloam. Then John even tells us what the term Siloam actually means. It means scent. Why does that matter? Well, it wouldn't be in there if it didn't matter. (laughs) What's the big deal with Jesus instructing this man to go and be washed in the pool of scent? Consider the fact that this whole conversation began with a question of sin. The assumption is that sin is what has caused this. He must really be a bad guy. Not like us, disciples, who are following Jesus around. We've left everything. We are the good guys. But as Jesus brings healing, he is also commissioning this guy, this bad guy, to go and tell others what Jesus has done for him. He is sending him out. You know, it's odd that sometimes God can use the least likely of people for the most holy of purposes. And that is exactly what God is doing through this man. In this story, we see that it is often when we are ready to pass judgment that God may be about to perform a 
transformation in an individual's life, giving them true purpose. He's like the primary character in our last sermon series, Saul, who was converted, and immediately God had a plan for him. He would become one of the greatest missionaries of all time. We simply cannot put God in a box. It doesn't work. So how do we fight against religious blindness? I'm going to give you three things that you can and you must do. The cure for religious blindness begins with studying hard, humbly praying, and erring toward grace. This means pouring over God's word until it becomes a part of who we are. This is more than just finding that verse that fits your agenda so that you can dispute certain things with other people. But it's about getting to know the heart of God within the scriptures. It's about getting to know the entirety of what God has for you. The sad reality is that very few Christians do this. In 2016, Lifeway did a survey of two groups of people. The first included those who would refer to the scriptures as the most important authority in their lives. The other group would be those who make no claim to the value of scripture. They're ordinary people in our world. According to their survey, those in the general population scored more accurately about what God expects of humanity than those who supposedly value the word so much in their lives. We're just using scripture as the gauge as to whether or not individuals understood what God expected of them. Those who make no claim to Christ, those who make no claim to the value of God's word, did better at identifying what God expects than even those who attend church regularly, who supposedly believe the word of God is so valuable in authority in their lives. Apparently, valuing the Word has not led to studying the Word. Instead, the Bible has become nothing more than a lucky charm, something to look good on our shelves. But what would happen if God's people would suddenly begin to immerse ourselves in the Scriptures once more? humbly praying for God's Spirit to speak to us through it. I'm going to tell you, incredible grace would naturally flow to us and through us, enabling us to bring that grace to other people. I was in a seminar earlier this week, and uh, the seminar was being done by a group of ministers The one that I listened to probably most intently was the one who had been in ministry the longest. He's in his 90s, and uh, I figure he's done it long enough. He's the one I should be listening to. And one of the questions was asked of him, how have you kept the fervor and the passion for ministry all these years? And his response was simple. He said, I made it a priority in my life that every single day I would spend time in prayer and in the word. I wonder if that is something from a previous generation that no longer applies to us today. I believe that it should, and I believe that if it would, that it would completely relieve the spiritual blindness that many of us may carry. Well, the disciples weren't the only blind people in this story. It wouldn't be long before the religious leaders would show up because something big's happened, so they want to be a part of it. But they're questioning the miraculous work that Jesus has done. And instead of rejoicing over this act, which you would think it's a great thing because this guy would have been a burden to society. He couldn't work, couldn't participate, couldn't earn his own money. So what's he going to do? He's going to ask for money from everybody else. You'd think they would have rejoiced over this. But instead, instead of rejoicing, they immediately become suspicious over what has taken place. Apparently, this miraculous work has occurred on the Sabbath. So this Jesus must be a sinner. Surely God couldn't work through such a man. So they set out to prove this miracle as a fraud. 
They even bring his parents in for questioning. And of course, they confirm that he is their son and that he was born blind. So then they ask this man how it is that he came to be healed. Look at the encounter beginning in verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. They have already made their determination from the very beginning. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Can, can you catch the sarcasm as he's speaking here? He knows they don't want to be his disciples, but you're asking it again. Why are you asking? Do you want to follow him? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And I love this guy's response. The man answered, now that is remarkable. Remember, he's already shown he's a little sarcastic with him, and he doesn't mind addressing the hypocrisy that's sitting right in front of him. He says, that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. Note that there is a kind of blindness that is worse than religious blindness. It's what happens when the truth is sitting right in front of you and you simply refuse to see it. I refer to this as willing or willful blindness. This man says, all I know is that I was blind, but now I see. And unfortunately, these guys still don't get it. They want to talk about how they know where Moses came from, yet they don't know where Jesus came from. And this man who can see clearer than ever before calls him out. You see, in the Jewish culture, there was a belief that only God had the ability to heal blindness. Nobody else. The demons couldn't heal blindness. There is nobody else in all of the world who could heal blindness, but they didn't want to believe what was sitting right in front of them. Now this, again, is something that still occurs today. There are many who choose ignorance because it's simply easier for us. But it typically comes with a great price. Listen, willful blindness is when there's information you could know and should know, but somehow you manage not to know. There are times that someone will tell us something that we really just don't want to hear. You see, the problem is that we could act in ignorance when we don't know. But now that we know, we can't continue to think and act the way we did before. Once you have that information, there is a responsibility on you that you will do something with the information you have received. Now, I've had the privilege of sitting with multiple individuals as they have passed from this life into the next. I wish I could say that all of these transitions have been pleasant, but that is not true. Perhaps it's because not all people have the same destination after this life. I can remember one individual in particular, her name was Glenda, and hers, I would say, was a beautiful thing. She was a beautiful woman of God who was losing her battle with cancer. As she lay there in her bed, mostly motionless, suddenly her eyes lit up, she reached out her hands and she cried out, look, it's so beautiful. Can you see it? 
I want you to know that God's Spirit filled that room that day. But it wasn't because she was dying. See, God's Spirit was already present in that room. I like to go swimming with my kids. There have been multiple times where we'll be out there and it will begin to rain. I was with them one day, and it began to rain, and immediately one of the kids said, oh, it's starting to rain. And I looked at them, and I, I said, so what? You're already wet. <laughs> I think that there are times that we're waiting for God to show up, and he's already here, drenching us with his beauty and his grace. And when it starts to rain, then we realize, okay, now he's here. Now we can feel that God is present. But he's already been there. We've already been surrounded by him for so long. I'm going to suggest to you today that there are many of us who are sitting around waiting for God to do something, but he already is trying to do something in our midst. Some of us are experiencing religious blindness. God is working in our midst and we're missing it. Some of us, we are willfully ignoring the work that God is doing. Some of us need God to do an incredible miracle to remove the physical blindness, whatever your ailment is. Over these next several weeks, we're going to be looking at different individuals whom God transformed, but God moments where he stepped in and took one who was broken and he gave them life. What is it that God desires to do in you? Some of you today, maybe you're not dealing with physical blindness, but some of you need a physical touch, and there is no other hope except what we find in Jesus Christ. Maybe God wants to touch you physically. Some of you, you don't need a physical touch today, but you are spiritually blind you don't realize that God might even be challenging you, working in your own heart, and you're sitting here thinking to yourself, I sure hope so-and-so is listening to this. Or maybe you're even thinking, I wish the pastor would say this instead. Maybe what we need to do is say, God, what is it you have for me? I believe today that God wants to change each one of us. Not so that we can all see physically. But God wants to change us into his image more than anything, to make our hearts right with him. My question is, are you willing to allow him to do that? Let's pray. Father, as we come before you today, we are grateful for your transforming power, the ability that you have to take broken people and to make us whole and holy. Father, as we come before you today, we ask that you would Forgive us of our spiritual blindness. Father, we've become so focused on other people's brokenness and imperfections. Sometimes you're trying to penetrate our hearts, but we're too busy looking at everybody else. But I pray right now that you would transform our hearts, that we would be made new, to be made in the likeness of our Savior. Father, there are some people here today who need a physical touch. Maybe we've even questioned whether it's possible. But we know that we serve a God who can perform miracles. We have seen it firsthand. We know that you're able. So we ask today that you would do whatever it takes to make us into the people we need to be. If that means healing us from our sickness, Lord, we will rejoice over that. If that means allowing your grace to be sufficient for us in the midst of our sickness, we would be okay with that too. But Lord, we pray that you would have your way in us, transform everything about us, and we'll give you praise for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. By the way, if you... Uh, if you have individuals who do not yet know Christ, this entire series is going to be, I will tell you today is much more about you who are in the church. But this entire series is about the transforming work that God desires to do in those who need him. 
Maybe you have loved ones and friends and neighbors that you've been wanting to invite to church. This is a great time to invite them so that they can hear about how God can take them off of a path that leads to death, to eternal suffering, and give them the gift of eternal life. And I encourage you to invite them. We're going to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. And as we do, it is an opportunity and a privilege for us to be able to celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made for each one of us. Uh, as a part of this, I'm going to have the interns who will help in just a moment. But I want to remind you what this act is about. It is a ritual that is practiced in different churches in different ways. There are some who do this every time they come together. There are some who do this maybe once a quarter, maybe even less. Um, we do it about once a month, and it's an opportunity for us to simply remember the sacrifice that Jesus made as he brought to us the gift of salvation. Jesus, truthfully, he could have chosen a different route, but he came to die. I guess, in theory, God could have snapped his fingers and suddenly forgiveness would be available to all of humanity. But Jesus himself prayed in the garden. He said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. And the Father did not. Because there was already a, a system, a law that was in place that God had instilled from the very first sin. The wages of sin would be death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin by allowing his body to be broken and his blood to be shed so that our sins could be forgiven. As we participate in partaking of these elements, what we're really doing is saying, thank you. Thank you for allowing your body to be broken. Thank you for willingly shedding your blood so that my sins could be forgiven. As we do this, I'm going to invite individuals to come forward and receive the elements, but I'm going to ask you, uh, if, first of all, if, if you are toward the back, it'll take you a few minutes before you get up here. Use this as an opportunity to simply pray and thank God for what he has done for you, the salvation that has come. Use this as an opportunity maybe to recommit your, your own life to Christ. Maybe it's been a while since you've actually appreciated what he did for you. Let this be a time to simply celebrate. If you're toward the front, you're going to come up and you're going to be one of the first ones, but that means you're also going to have to wait for everybody else. So while you're back in your pews waiting for everybody else to receive the elements, allow this to be a time for you to pray, to thank God for what these elements actually represent. There's nothing special about it. Truthfully, it's, it's bread and it's grape juice, but what they represent is incredibly special. The bread represents the body of Jesus that was broken for them. The grape juice will represent the blood of Jesus that was shed for them. I'm going to pray over the elements. The uh, individuals who I've invited to come up and help will come, and then we will invite you to come and receive these elements. Father, we thank you for your gift of grace that was given through the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you willingly lay down your life for us, allowing, allowing us to be forgiven, to be set free, and to be renewed. Lord, I pray that these elements would take on new meaning, and I pray that you would help us today to simply be transformed by the blood of Jesus and by the by the body of Jesus being broken for us. Father, I pray today that you would use this time to help renew within us a heart of surrender. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to come. There are three different stations that you can come to to receive the elements. We invite you to come at this time.
As Jesus met with his disciples on the last night, he shared with them about what would take place, and he said that his body would be broken and his blood would be shed. The disciples did not fully understand as they believed he had come to establish a new kingdom. They did not expect him to die, but rather they expected him to overcome what they did not understand is he would first have to die in order to overcome, because he did not come just to overcome the Romans, but he came to overcome sin and death. Jesus Christ willingly allowed his body to be broken so that we might have life. He said, this bread represents my body that is broken for you. Every time you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. He then took the wine, and again, this is just grape juice, but he then took the wine and he said, this is my blood that is shed for you. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, there is eternal life. Our sins are washed away. He said, this is my blood that is shed for you. Every time you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Father, as we come before you today, Again, we thank you for the body. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the life that has been given to us. Thank you that you have redeemed us and you have given us an incredible promise. Lord, one day we will see you face to face. Thank you that you fill this place with your spirit today. We pray that you would help us to appreciate your presence. May you be honored in us as we leave this place in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a privilege to have you with us this morning, and I invite you. We won't do communion next week, but again, please invite your friends over the next three weeks. I have three more weeks of this series, and it is all about the transforming work that God can do in an individual's life. Thank you for being with us, and go in peace.